who have been working in the territory for five years and are changing employers will no longer be required to leave the territory during the transitioning process. The government of the Virgin Islands has introduced changes to the Immigration and Passport Act to allow the chief immigration officer to grant a permit to persons to remain in the territory for the purpose of seeking employment. Welcome to this Public Eye program as we discuss the amendments to the Act and what it means for the British Virgin Islands. I am your host, GIS Information Officer, Nadia James Harris, and joining me during the first segment of the program is Acting Permanent Secretary in the Premier's Office, Mr. Broderick Penn, and Acting Chief Immigration Officer, Mr. Ian Penn. During our second segment, Deputy Secretary in the Premier's Office, Mrs. Geraldine Ritter Freeman, will join us. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after this short break. There is no vaccine to prevent Zika. The best way to prevent diseases spread by mosquitoes is to avoid being bitten. Protect yourself and your family from mosquito bites. And here's how. Wear long sleeve shirts and long pants. Stay in places with air conditioning or that use window and door screens to keep mosquitoes outside. Apply insect repellent as directed. If you're also using sunscreen, apply sunscreen before applying insect repellent. If you have a baby or child, do not use insect repellents on babies younger than two months of age. Dress your child in clothing that covers arms and legs. Cover crib, stroller, and baby carrier with mosquito netting. No mosquitoes, no bites, no disease. Mosquito control is all of our business. Let's make it personal. A message from the Ministry of Health, Government of the Virgin Islands. The Government of the Virgin Islands has introduced some changes to the Immigration and Passport Act. Can you explain and provide our listeners with a summary of what these changes are and what they mean for the territory? Yeah. Ms. Harris, in summary, the changes that we just introduced does two key things. In the first instance, it allows persons that have been working in the territory for five years to be able to seek other employment when their employment circumstances change without having to leave the territory. In the second instance, persons that have been residing in the territory perhaps as a dependent of a spouse, are now able to seek employment without having to leave the territory. The importance of that is, is that it reduces um, undue um, burdens, um, perhaps uh, reduces financial hardships from having to ask people to leave the territory when they find an opportunity for um, employment. What are the overall benefits of this amendment? The, the, the benefits are, um, as I stated before, um, primarily to relieve um, financial and social hardships. Um, in many circumstances, we've had, so, we've had situations where persons um, may have been asked to um, leave the territory in accordance with the, 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 the law, um, but um, it affects them financially because they may have living obligations such as rent. They may have um, financial obligations in terms of bank commitments, um, etc. They may have social obligations related to young kids in school, um, etc. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to be able to uh, create an environment where um, workers who are um, legally and lawfully here in the territory are in a position where if their job circumstances change, um, they wouldn't have to go through significant undue burdens. It's from a wider policy perspective, immigration reform has been a central um, focus for um, the ministry. As a coordinated ministry, um, we are charged and responsible for um, policy development. Um, immigration is one of those key areas within the ministry with which we look to conduct um, policy um, reform. Um, there's a number of areas within uh, immigration that requires um, policy reform. 
And I think this is one of the key areas that we've um, singled out as a priority for uh, reform. We have um, had um, a, a number of circumstances where uh, persons are negatively affected um, by the way uh, the policy is currently um, implemented. And we decided to take a, a, a look at it with um, our immigration officials to see if we can come up with something that works um, in the best interest of um, persons. There was a lot of ambiguity um, around how um, the policy was administered. Uh, often, uh, people change jobs and they um, seek to remain in the territory. Um, and uh, what we decided to do is we decided to build a framework that is clear that is unambiguous and where people can have certainty as to the circumstances um, when they change jobs. The primary um, benefits um, to me is to uh, alleviate um, financial hardships um, as well as to ensure that um, uh, social inequities are taken care of um, as to how the policy is, is implemented. Uh, for example, if persons are asked to leave the country when they are changing jobs, many of those persons sometimes are very settled um, in, the, in the Virgin Islands. They may have kids in school, they may have financial um, obligations, they may have um, specific obligations to um, lending institutions, etc. Um, it frankly disrupts um, persons' lives. And I think it's very important to understand that the amendment um, to the law really affects persons. There's a threshold and it affects persons who we think are settled in the country. And it is only fair and helpful um, to be able to alleviate those um, financial and otherwise um, negative circumstances if they're asked to leave. Mr. Penn, Chief Immigration Officer. Yes, who would be affected by this amendment? You're on the front line, your staff, your team, you see what is going on, you hear of the different scenarios and the cases, and you, you would know firsthand what this amendment means and the importance of this. Tell us more about the effects, who would be affected? All persons who are subjected to immigration control would be affected by this amendment. And how would the new transitioning process work now? Okay, this process, it would be more streamlined, meaning that persons would have to apply in writing to the chief immigration officer to change this, um, to remain in the territory uh, when changing um, job once they meet the criteria that's in the amendment, and every person who apply will be uh, reviewed um, personally by the chief immigration officer or by the surveillance unit in the immigration department, and those persons will be interviewed and they would have to submit along with their application <clears throat> Along with the application, they would have to submit a uh, bank reference, bank reference, and once those are submitted, then a response, a response in writing will be given to them, letting them know um, if they have been approved. And the reason for this is that we would like to have it to be more accountable, and it would um, enable us to scrutinize the process uh, much more closely to ensure that what we are doing, we are doing it correctly. What would be the role of the prospective employer or the form and the former employer in this situation? Clarify the steps that these persons would have to take. The role of the former employer what the former, former employer would have to do would send in a release letter if the person um, has resigned or if the employer has 
um, sever the relationship, the employment relationship with the employee, then what the employer is expected to do is to um, send in a release letter to the immigration department addressed to the chief immigration officer. What this does is that it tells the chief immigration officer that this person who was working for this establishment, they have severed the relationship because there would have been a bond in place. And that bond is for the purpose, you know, just to show that if anything has to happen with that employee, then um, the employer would be responsible if that employee has to be repatriated by immigration. Once that is sent into immigration, then um, the process starts where the employee, if, if successful, would be given a time limit to seek further employment. Once employment is found, is found, then the new employer, the new employer would have to uh, send something in writing to the chief immigration officer to state that the um, employee is now would be in the employment of this company and therefore the chief immigration officer would know that um, the employee has fulfilled his mandate of seeking employment. Mr. Penn, remind us of the process, how different it would be for someone who has been under the territory just under five years, maybe four and a half years, four years, 11 months. They haven't met, quite met the five-year mark. What would it be for them if they wish to transition to a new job? Well, Ms. Harris, <clears throat> we will look at every case on a case-by-case -case basis, okay? What I would say, even those who have met, who have met the five-year mark, it doesn't necessarily mean that when they apply, uh, they would be approved, okay? Because, as I said, everyone would have to be interviewed, um, a number of um, questions, uh, some investigation would be made to determine um, the approval process of, you know, someone seeking for, um, to come in to, to seek further employment. However, persons who fall merely under the five-year period, as I stated, you know, we will look at every case, you know, by a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, it would mean investigating, you know, why, um, you know, they have left their employment or why the relationship was severed with the um, employer and everything will be taken into consideration, the chief immigration officer uh, would have the discretion to make you know, such a call, even though they may be just under the five-year mark. Thank you, Mr. Penn. It's now time for a public service announcement break. And when we return in the second segment of our program, Deputy Secretary in the Premier's Office, Mrs. Geraldine Ritter Freeman, joins me to discuss more about the Immigration and Passport Ordinance, CAP 130, and the Immigration and Passport Regulations. Stay tuned, we will be right back after this short break. Hello, I am Mark Vanderpool, Minister for Communications and Works. As you know, the government of the Virgin Islands is improving the territory's electricity infrastructure through the Phase 5 Power Development Program. And as we continue to develop this aspect, we need your help in conserving energy. Here's how. 1. Turn off lights and equipment when they're not in use. 2. Use the sunlight to brighten up a room whenever possible. Three, switch out old water heaters for an energy efficient solar water heating unit. And the four, install LED lights, which are also energy efficient throughout your home and office. These are just a few ways you can contribute to improving our energy sustainability, save money, conserve energy, 
and help us build our territory for a brighter tomorrow. Welcome back to our Public Eye program where we're discussing the amendments to the Immigration and Passport Act. I am pleased to introduce Deputy Secretary in the Premier's Office, Mrs. Geraldine Ritter Freeman, to our program. Welcome to our program. Thank you, Mrs. Nadia, Freeman. for having me. <laughs> we're discussing the amendments, and can you please outline for us the differences between the Act and the regulations as it relates to the Immigration and the Passport Act? Ms. Harris, firstly, thank you for allowing us to come to um, first speak about the amendments that were recently made in the House and to just give the public as much information as possible to ensure that they are aware of what is to come and so that everybody will confirm to what is expected in the future. Uh, one of the things we have to um, appreciate is that when we're dealing with policy and change to law, it's a process. Okay, so uh, part of the process that we are undertaking now is the, or, or that transpired on the 20th was the bill that went to the House of Assembly, which essentially is the amendment to the Act. Okay, um, when you're making changes to the Act or law, uh, that process has to go through the House of Assembly. It has to be approved through Cabinet and then it goes to House of Assembly and the normal process as we know it in the House of Assembly where it's debated um, and all of the members of the House of Assembly give an opportunity to weigh in on the topic and then it's eventually passed um, through the House. When we're talking about the regulations, we're talking um, essentially about more particulars that will be required to if, um, bring the Act into effect. So. While the Act is dealing specifically with the amendment that we've spoken about in the first um, part of the program where we're talking about issuing permits to deal with persons changing jobs as well as persons who are residing in the territory and changing to employment. Those are the two clauses that we were addressing um, in particular. Now in the regulations, we're going to be dealing with more specifics. Now the regulations doesn't have to go to the House of Assembly, but it has to be gazetted as we know it. And so what will happen with the regulations, we'll be dealing now with more of the how. So we're dealing with um, uh, the particulars in terms of how long we're going to be granting the permits for, um, who will be allowed to get the permits, because you know it's we have quite a bit of um, restrictions that we've also placed into the regulations so that it's not, as people are perceiving, it's going to be for everybody and we open the floodgates, that kind of thing. So we're really um, addressing things like um, possibility of fees that would be applied. We're talking about um, the 90 days threshold um, to, up to, to, for the workers to be able to seek employment. And it's also um, important to note at this stage that it's only one in every five years. So if you're applying for the, um, uh, for the permit to seek employment after you've met the requirement, you can only get this, you can only be granted this uh, permit once in every five years. So then there's some restrictions that we really need the public to understand and, and to appreciate because one of the things we don't want, we don't want the public to um, feel that this applies to everybody. I think the chief immigration officer in the first, um, in the first segment, segment spoke yes. about who the act will affect or who the amendment will affect. And I think we'll speak a little bit more about that as we go along. Yes. We've spoken about, you mentioned that the changes, there were two sets of changes that went to, that were part of the amendment. We had the permit, the application for the permit to seek permission for in further employment, mm -hmm. as well as the change in status yes. permit. Can you share more about that particular amendment? Okay, so the act, we're dealing with two clauses. The first clause is dealing with persons who have met the five-year requirement that was spoken to before, who are either changing their jobs or they've been dismissed from their jobs. Those individuals will have 90 days will be granted permission to remain in the territory for approximately for 90 days to seek employment. If that 90 day threshold um, they do not meet, they may have to reapply and maybe they can, based on the circumstances, get an um, extension or they, they too would have to leave the territory. Um, the other clause applies to persons who 
received initial initial permit to reside in the territory. Um, persons, for example, um, a spouse may be here with, with their um, partner who's working, but they're just here residing with that individual. But after three years, that individual decides for whatever reason they would like to seek employment. This is where this particular um, amendment will apply to that individual. They're changing from residing in the territory to seeking employment. And um, that's where the second clause comes in, change of status. You've spoken about exceptional circumstances, I'm guessing for both of the, yes. the amendments that have been made. What are some of the scenarios as it relates to exceptional circumstances? Is there, a, is there some type of guideline that can give our audience an idea of where they can fall in? Well, as you know, the Chief Immigration Officer has um, discretionary powers um, on a whole. And so when we're looking at the amendments as they are, we also have to consider that the Chief Immigration Officer does have those discretionary powers um, and the case-by-case -case basis that was mentioned earlier. Yes. But um, essentially, the exceptional circumstances, which I wish the Chief Immigration Officer would speak more to in the next part of the program, but um, he would have to look at the, each case um, as it's presented. And there are a number of um, circumstances of which exceptional circumstances may apply, and he will elaborate. Um, but we, what we want to say to people is, yes, we have the law, and the law is there for, for us to be used as a guide, and we don't want a situation where people are going ultra-virus to the law, and so we want people to adhere to the law, but we do know that the chief immigration officer in his seat has some discretionary powers, and in those circumstances, he can exercise those powers. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Thank you for explaining the regulations and the act for our viewers. And in wrapping up our program, we are going to be inviting back a permanent secretary in the Premier's office, Mr. Broderick Penn, and Chief Immigration Officer, Mr. Ian Penn, who will return for some additional thoughts on this amendment. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this short break. Okay, so here's the 411 on Zika virus, dengue fever, and chikungunya. For those of you who may not know, it's the same fight. The same mosquito, the Aedes aegypti mosquito, can give you Zika, dengue fever, and chikungunya. There is no vaccine or treatment for these viruses, so your best defense is a great offense. Protect yourself at all costs. Start with ensuring that you are not breeding mosquitoes by conducting weekly inspections of your property to identify potential breeding sites. Avoid being bitten by mosquitoes, period. Wear long and loose clothing and use mosquito repellent products. No mosquitoes, no bites, no disease. Mosquito control is all of our business. Let's make it personal. A message from the Ministry of Health, Government of the Virgin Islands. Welcome back to our program. Joining me, returning I should say to this segment, we have Chief Immigration Officer, Mr. Ian Penn. We have Permanent Secretary in the Premier's Office, Mr. Broderick Penn, and Deputy Secretary in the Premier's Office, Mrs. Geraldine Ritter Freeman. And my three guests are here. We're going to be having some further discussions on the Immigration and Passport Bill, Immigration and Passport Act that has been recently passed. Mrs. Freeman, in the previous segment, she had spoken about exceptional circumstances. And Chief Immigration Officer, Mr. Penn, can you elaborate on exceptional circumstances as it relates to persons who may be under the five-year mark, but they're still coming in to, they would still like to apply for a permit? Some exceptional circumstances um, could fall into the remit of where um, a person is employed and that person could be um, sexually harassed by uh, another employee or employer and is forced to leave. So that's one scenario. But however, 
um, those scenarios, when they come into immigration, or, or that scenario, uh, there must be proof. So someone just can't come in and say that, you know, they were sexually harassed and, you know, expect, you know, that the, that the department will, would, not even, would grant approval. They, 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 they must provide proof, meaning that, um, you know, they should report the matter to the relevant authorities and therefore our report will be submitted to the chief immigration officer. <clears throat> Another scenario could be um, cases where um, an employee has been unfairly dismissed. And again, you know, that would be on a case-by-case -case basis with, uh, when the person would come in and, and uh, their interview statements are taken from the employee and also from the employer. And then um, we will look at it and then the, uh, our decision will be made. Okay. We also have cases where a um, person may have fallen ill on the job and was unable to work for some period of time. And um, by the time they you know, were able to you know, get better, um, the employer um, has severed their, their, you know, their employment relationship. So those are some of the um, scenarios you know, that, we, um, that would come under exceptional circumstances. I think it's important to understand, uh, Ms. Harris, I think it's important for the public to understand that while Mr. Penn has given a flavor of some of the circumstances that we anticipate might be treated um, as exceptional circumstances, um, there will be guidance um, that will be created outlining um, a number of these um, scenarios so that there can be a consistent approach to um, the, the exceptional circumstances. Um, we have created um, this new law to provide certainty in how um, the scenarios are dealt with. And we certainly will have guidance within the immigration department to be able to follow so that we can be doing it on a consistent basis. Uh, and I think it's important though to add that one of the, probably the most important areas that I see from a policy perspective um, that would qualify for exceptional circumstances is um, circumstances within which um, a spouse is married to um, a BVI lander. Um, there may be um, scenarios, and we've experienced these, where um, a person may be married to a, a BVI lender, but has not yet achieved their own um, BVI um, status um, or, uh, or work permit exemption, and so they're subject to immigration controls. Um, certainly in a circumstance like that, if that spouse that's married to a BVI lender wanted to change um, jobs, we would, um, and they didn't qualify for the five-year period, we certainly would look at that as an exceptional circumstance um, and, 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 and review the case. That's one that immediately jumps out to me. We've had, we're hearing about the five-year blanket and we've had some viewpoints that it should be uh, something that is for everyone. Why five years? Why was the decision made to take, to have a five-year mark for this type of permit to be issued? Um, I can add to that question, Nadia. With regards to the stipulations in the amendments, uh, we gave significant thought to uh, what it meant to certain individuals with regards to the specific um, complaints that we were seeing reoccurring. And we thought, and when we were looking at the law as it is, that persons who have settled in the British Virgin Islands for a period of about five years, and you, you, you can put yourself into that scenario. You've lived in the territory for five years, and as the PS um, explained, the permanent secretary explained, you know, you've settled, you, you have certain things in place to ask you to leave. It's sometimes, you know, we looked at it as being unreasonable. Um, these persons are working in the territory legally, and in most cases, these persons would be allowed back into the territory. So to have them to leave just um, uh, because they are changing jobs or they were dismissed from their jobs, we thought it was reasonable and practical to give them a specific time frame, not an unlimited time frame, but a specific time frame to reassess their situation and to seek further employment. And we really believe that that was reasonable. And I think that um, from a government standpoint, we have a responsibility, not just to our citizens, but we also have a responsibility to our visitors and residents. And that was strongly considered. 
In terms of labor and immigration reform, this amendment, would it be considered as a part of the reform initiatives that the government is undertaking? Absolutely. Um, I think um, members of the public would be aware that we've engaged on a, um, a wider uh, policy initiative of um, reforming um, immigration and labor practices um, for a number of reasons. Um, we want to improve efficiency. Um, we want to ensure that persons are treated um, fairly. We want to make sure that the system is right. We want to make sure that we're consistent with what's happening in, in, in other jurisdictions. But most of all, we want to create and design a system that works for us and works for um, our territory, our economy, and the persons living and residing in the, in the BVI. Part and parcel of that obviously is um, developing BVI land capacity, but another part of it is being able to um, retain and attract the right level of talent that we need to be able to foster um, growth within um, our, our, our industries. So it certainly is um, a, a subset of the wider reform uh, that we are looking at from the, um, from the immigration um, perspective. Would you say that this amendment would affect the employment growth rates within the territory? As you, as you speak about building capacity and making sure that the industries, the various industries are properly, they have the proper skills and expertise? Yeah. We don't see it as affecting employment growth rates. Um, what we see is it being able to affect um, continuity in the workplace. I think something that's um, vitally important um, to ensure um, that our um, workplaces are operating at optimal level. We see it in terms of creating um, continuity for the persons that are employed um, also. Um, as I said before, we want to be able to retain um, some of the best talent here in the BVI so that our industries um, can grow. Um, so rather than seeing any changes in terms of the growth rate, we really see it as positively affecting um, the economy and industries. I'd like to add though, um, I think there's a real concern with regards to whether BVI landers will be disenfranchised by um, some of the reform initiatives that are being considered. And I think it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair concern, and I think it that it's something that we're quite conscious about when we're making changes to the Immigration Ordinance Border Control, we appreciate um, is very critical um, for our security here in the territory. Um, and so it's not something that we're taking lightly. It's something that we continue to ponder. I mean, sitting around the table when we're having these discussions, we're constantly reminded of BVI Landers' role and responsibility and their own contribution to our respective um, areas, whether it be tourism or financial services. And so it's important that we, um, that the public understands that we are very much conscious in terms of the question of BVI Landers being disenfranchised. And we want to include BVI Landers. We want to make sure that BVI Landers are trained and developed in order to take up their respective positions within the community and within the business sector. So um, I think it's a valid concern. Um, but I think if, if, if we can just say on this program, we're very much conscious of some of the possible um, um, adverse effects and we take those things into consideration and it's something that we really have a conversation and discussion about when we're making changes. To, to put that into a summarized context, Ms. 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 Harris, the safeguards are there. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about um, immigration reform in this particular instance uh, that allows um, persons that meet a certain threshold to remain in the territory. But these persons are going to be subject to um, labor controls and the labor laws. Nothing in uh, the amendments um, to facilitate entry effectively uh, from an immigration perspective affects what these persons would have to do in terms of conforming with the labor laws, mm -hmm. qualifying for um, the, 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 the jobs, making sure that the jobs are um, available for BVI landers first. Um, Etc. Exactly. So I think there are a lot of safeguards in there. On the one hand, we're talking about immigration um, reform, but there is um, labor controls and the fundamental safeguards that's built in the labor laws. Um, so I don't see it as a significant concern. In the last few moments of our program, are there any closing thoughts from each of you? We've been discussing a very substantial topic 
in this program as it relates to immigration and the Passport Act. And we just want to make sure that we have our viewers have a sound takeaway, sound thoughts. Do you have anything that you would like to leave with them as we prepare to close our program? I would just want to say that um, I think the persons, the respective agencies that have contributed to where we are thus far with the changes in the amendments, we've had some other changes in uh, with immigration, we've had the changes to the entry form, as many people know already, and the Permanent Secretary spoke about um, other things that we're working on uh, when we speak about immigration reform, and a number of agencies, um, private and public, that have participated in this process thus far. Fun. I think we want to recognize those people and we want to continue to encourage that sort of feedback from the public um, and as well from within the public sector where we can continue to make positive changes um, that has um, significant impact to us as a, t a people here in the territory and so we are going to continue to press on. It's, sometimes it's not easy, the process takes longer than we would all than we all would like but um, we are continuing to be steadfast in our approach um, with the with the chief immigration officer um, the ministry and all the other stakeholders to make the necessary changes we recognize that change is needed and we are doing what we can to make those um, changes a reality and we understand that it's not just when we're speaking in the context of the british virgin islands and we look in the region and we look internationally, we know that there are certain standards of which we are to comply and meet. And so we are doing our part to make sure that we meet those standards, albeit human rights, um, border protection, and, 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 and so it's, it's a process. But we are doing what we can to make sure that the BVI is where we need to be. Mr. Brown? Ms. Harris, I think it's important um, for uh, the BVI public to understand and appreciate that we live in a global village. Um, living in that, um, what we like to say, that new normal of what the global village is now um, requires that um, all our laws and policies are fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and um, invariably so, um, we try to look at um, changing our laws um, from a policy perspective um, so that it is done in the best interest um, of the BVI um, but we also have to do it through um, the lens of the of the global scene, mm -hmm. and if that means making um, reforms to our immigration um, laws or any other laws um, within the the BVA, that is going to put the BVA in an advantage of position to um, connect with that global village, to grow our industries, um, and to um, develop um, the capacity within the BVA. I think then it's something that we have to do. In the particular case of immigration, we're careful um, to do it, trying to balance the interests of where we want our economy to go against um, the border protection. That's a fundamental mandate of, of them. But I think it has to be understood that there must be a balance between um, those two things. And um, from where all of us sit as BVI landers, we will um, protect BVI. And whatever policies and measures that we put in place, it's going to be in, in the interest of the BVI. On Wednesday, April 20th, Premier and Minister of Finance, Dr. The Honorable D. Orlando Smith, OBE, who also holds the Portfolio for Immigration, brought the amendment to the Immigration and Passport Act to the House of Assembly. Premier Smith explained that the amendments were necessary to reduce any detrimental social effects and unnecessary financial hardships on families, businesses, and the economy. My featured guest on this Public Eye program to discuss the amendments and its benefits to the territory have been Acting Permanent Secretary in the Premier's Office, Mr. Broderick Penn, Acting Chief Immigration Officer, Mr. Ian Penn, and Deputy Secretary in the Premier's Office, Mrs. Geraldine Ritter Freeman. For the Department of Information and Public Relations in the Premier's Office, I've been your host, GIS Information Officer, Nadia James Harris. Keep up with the latest events and get your official government news. Remember to visit the government website at bvi.gov.bg or follow us on Facebook, YouTube or Twitter at BVI Government.